This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. In each episode, we bring you information, insights, and ideas from some of the industry's top thought leaders. Connect with us to help pick the topic and guide the show. This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. I'm your host, Jamie Wood, coming from my very unprofessional home studio this week, still in the midst of uh, finding a more permanent solution. But in the meantime, thanks for persisting with the sound quality. Now, our topic today, selling multi-platform media. Whether you work in legacy media like print or TV or radio, or whether you work in digital media or trade media or event-based media, it's highly likely that you sell more than just a single medium or a single product these days. Multi-platform media solutions are the way of the future, and it is an increasing challenge for media salespeople, but it is also a massive opportunity for the industry as well. If you get this wrong, you can really quickly find yourself missing revenue opportunities, burning client relationships, and just spending a hell of a lot of time on like really tedious, really unfocused, low return, messy, busy work kind of activities. If, on the other hand, you can get it right, if you can go to market with a really cogent strategy, if you can have a really clear understanding of what that proposition is, how to really clearly articulate it in market, even though there's a lot of moving parts, um, you've got massive opportunity. I mean, you're going to be able to win business. You're going to be able to deliver richer solutions to your clients. You can really future-proof your career. You can start to build capability and knowledge across a whole spectrum of different products, which is only going to fare well for you moving into the future. Our guest today, uh, very happy to have Helen Coston of Inktop. Now, these guys are based in the UK. They're a specialist media sales training and consultant agency, and they help publishers and media sales teams achieve their commercial ambitions. I'm going to get Helen to go a bit more into it. On a personal note, like this particular facet of media sales is a bit of a passion point of mine. Uh, you'll notice if you listen to the back catalog, I cover this type of topic, or at least refer to this topic of increasingly diverse and complex product suites a lot, because it is a massive focus of mine. It's a massive focus of all the people I talk to. How do we simplify? How do we really realize the full value? How do we get to a place where multi-platform selling is just an easy thing to do, and we've got the muscle memory to do it well? So that is enough from me. The only thing I will say is, if you guessed LinkedIn, you guessed correctly. Add me to LinkedIn. Send me a message. Tell me the content that you want to hear. Tell me the topics you wish to discuss. Send me or continue to send me the questions you want us to tackle in real time. And uh, throw me a cheeky like or a comment on some of my posts as well. That is it for now. Let's get into it. The first five. Helen, welcome to the show. Hi, Jamie. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Great to have you. Now, look, before we jump into the episode, can you give us a bit of an overview of Inktop and what, what it is that you guys do? Yeah, sure. So um, at Inktop, we help publishers achieve their commercial ambitions. And the way we do this is through um, creating advertising strategies for our clients. And we also offer very specialist media sales training to teams um, to help them develop not only their sales skills, but also to deepen their industry knowledge as well. And we do offer a couple of, for a couple of clients, we also offer outsource sales as well. Now, we're actually doing, and I think I came across you on LinkedIn, we're discussing the topic today of selling multi-platform media. And I've noticed that you do quite a bit of work in this space with publishers who you know, may have traditionally been in print or are now sort of expanding into other platforms and other channels. In your observation, I mean, how difficult is this adaptation for media sales professionals? What are some of those major challenges or pitfalls that you're seeing media salespeople uh, encounter when they're trying to sell that multi-platform offering? Absolutely. That's a great question, Jamie. And I think you know, many of our clients have built their publishing businesses um, in pre or maybe even the early internet era. And of course, we've seen this dramatic change in content consumption, and that's led to new publishing strategies, um, which of course then means building new commercial strategies to generate advertising revenue. Um, and in many cases, we're seeing it's a very digitally first publishing operation that our clients are now running. And of course, there, this is, you know, this is quite a big change for media sales professionals. And I think it's really a, a mindset um, kind of thing that media sales professionals, I think, you know, in this day and age need to think in a more platform agnostic way. And I think the best way to sell advertising space or kind of commercial partnerships with publishing is by 
putting clients' needs and objectives first and then working backwards to create, you know, packages that are really, really going to work for them, you know, across multiple different channels. But, you know, that kind of thinking requires a lot more creativity, I think, than it's needed in the past. And I think that's where media sales professionals can really, you know, really kind of just need to change the way that they think a little bit and uh, just adapt their sales approach to fit it a little bit more easily. It's a great call. I know I spent 11 years in commercial radio and I think largely radio was quite good at always embracing new platforms and and new products and trying to incorporate them into a sales proposition but we're still fundamentally selling a core product or a core you know a core medium being obviously just broadcast radio um but it is interesting seeing that space start to evolve now where all publishers particularly in the Australian market some publishers might actually have radio television digital and print assets all within the same publishing house and the uh, just the expectation on those frontline salespeople to then have a strong acumen and knowledge of all those different mediums and how they can actually work together and make their way on a plan. Um, it just seems to be the trend that we're going to continue to see. Are you seeing that in the UK and some other markets in Europe as well? Yes, absolutely. You know, the way that we're working these days, um, certainly in the UK, is not just selling on an individual kind of platform platform by platform approach and um, as exactly as you say pl- publishers are working across many many different channels now and of course that means for me to sales professional their role is just so much more complex than it was even from a few years ago well that's the topic we're going to dive into today so let's do it media sales mastery at a really high level why are media publishers increasingly moving into having a multi-platform offering that's a great question i think it's driven truly by the way that our audiences and our readers are consuming content. You know, we all need our content to be read and engaged with. Otherwise, paid subscriptions will fall. Or if it's, you know, a free publication, a free content site, it's just not going to be engaged with if the content's not delivered in a way that a reader wants it to. And I think, you know, certainly publishers that I've worked with uh, that have conducted reader surveys or analysed their data have certainly found patterns of behavior that all kind of lead towards having a multi-platform content suite really does suit their audience. So I think it's only natural, therefore, um, when you're planning a commercial strategy is to really look at that holistically and to look at where the engagement really falls and where the kind of opportunities are um, and then work around that into building kind of, you know, commercial opportunities for advertisers. Yeah, it is interesting because I think we do see certain media where, for example, you might be working with a media sales professional who's well-versed in a particular medium, say print media, for example, Um, and then they're starting to see that obviously their audiences are consuming the content across different platforms, maybe social, maybe some digital products. Um, I know a lot of publishers are really moving into that event-based space as well, which is a media media channel as well. What are some of the things that you might sort of typically advise a media sales professional to do when they're looking to build out that multi-platform sales proposition? We work on this in our training sessions as well. I would really always advise media sales professionals to just have really, really open conversations with advertisers, you know, rather than contact somebody and say, you know, hey, I've got a full page and the next issue is of interest to you. You know, I would say better contact them and say, you know, hey, prospect <laughs> i wondered you know how your plans are looking for the next quarter are you are you doing any work any marketing and and then wait for them to tell you a little bit more about what they're doing for example if they're looking at increasing their brand awareness or if they're looking um at creating content or if they're looking at lead generation and then once you know a little bit more about what their priorities are you can work backwards and say well i think you know, the print magazine would work really well for this area, but perhaps let's do some digital content to support your, you know, your SEO work, for example. So, yeah, I would just start with what your your client is really looking for and then work backwards. I think that's a great suggestion because I think this is where we can often get a little bit confused as media sales professionals with a, with a fairly diverse product offering is trying to understand the role of each of the different platforms. You know, should we sell an integrated solution and bundle them all together or can we actually solve different, different business problems with different products and keep them quite quarantined from one another? Um, because, you know, that example I gave earlier, I mean, a media sales professional might have three to 15 different types of assets or products or platforms within that product suite that they're selling. 
Well, how do you sort of decode that? Like, are there any tips for, for really making sense of the role of each product um, and just getting an understanding of, of what each product might do and how that sort of fits into the broader ecosystem? That is a great question, Jamie. I think it's so easy to feel overwhelmed by the number of different assets or products that any one publisher has these days. And, um, you know, if you're working for a contract publisher, then you might be working across multiple clients, multiple magazines as well. So then the number just gets multiplied even further. And I think as humans, you know, we tend yeah. to naturally just stick to stuff we know when we're selling. You know, we find it easier to sell things that we completely understand. So an, an understanding of all the different assets and products and how they kind of fit together, I think, is essential to sales success. And in order to help that, I think I've seen examples where having an internal approach in which sales teams really feel part of the publishing strategy in some way can can really help them to build that understanding you know, for example, have the head of digital explain the key trends of the website, because it just helps salespeople to better understand, you know, the product, if you want to call it that, that they're selling. And I've seen it work best where the sessions are quite informal, and there are opportunities for sales teams to ask questions without feeling as though, you know, that it's a stupid question anyway, and just just being able to have those conversations internally to help build understanding. I couldn't agree more with the content strategy. I was just thinking about that it's it seems to me that um, there are different ethoses that different publishers have. Some of them actually keep the content strategy very close to their chest and don't don't necessarily share that with the sales team. And then other sale, uh, other organizations seem to be really functional in that area. Like they really have a great relationship between the two, you know, the, the content side of the business and the commercial side of the business. It's a great call out, you know, just really trying to understand what that content strategy is. I thought that's worth really highlighting. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're a more commercially led publisher, then yeah, of course, you know, the feedback from advertisers and from the sales team are really going to help to shape and build that kind of content strategy into the future. Even if you're not led by commercial feedback or or anything like that, then it's still worth understanding and explaining to the sales team why you're doing what you're doing. And it gives them the confidence and the authority when speaking to advertisers to explain what's happening, basically. So, um, yeah, I just think no matter what the circumstance, having a sales team that really, really understand the the business that they're in uh, can only help improve sales and sales performance. The changing face of media too is that publishers are all, you know, finding ways to distribute their content across more platforms than ever before. And one of the things that can sometimes be quite simple in terms of framing the, the challenge for a media sales professional is you want to look at all the content distribution platforms you have and just make sure that they're linked to a revenue opportunity. So, thinking about how the audience are actually consuming the content, why they're consuming it on those different platforms, and then just thinking about a way to really leverage an advertiser um, in that environment with, you know, with that attention. It's, um, it, it seems to kind of lead to this next question, which is that we do kind of look at you know, media, like traditional above-the-line media and digital as if they're two very separate strands or two very separate disciplines. I think things are converging, but Digital media does seem to be a challenge for people to adopt when they've got a long, uh, you know, a long tenure in selling a traditional media, um, you know, and it's understandable, right? There's different metrics, there's different capability required, there's a different competitive set often that we're competing against for revenue, and I think often you find that clients um, are quite savvy. I know a lot of media sales professionals can be be actually quite intimidated and often feel like their client might actually know more about the product than uh, than they do. <laughs> what are some of the suggestions that you might have for sort of increasing that baseline digital knowledge? What are the things that, that a media sales professional should really prioritize learning without sort of going down the rabbit hole or being too overwhelmed with all the different metrics and, and innovations that are there? Oh my God, this I can completely relate to, Jamie. Like I was talking to an advertiser the other day um, and they'd booked some digital activity with me. And then afterwards, um, you know, I called them to see how they were and they started telling me about all these UTM trackers they placed and all this behavioral insight that they had based on that, this kind of activity that they'd done. And I've actually had a marketing role before and I've used Google Analytics all the time. But even with that, like I just felt so overwhelmed by all this um, insight that they were getting. And yeah, I think it's, it's you know, market, marketers are just becoming so digitally savvy and that kind of knowledge that they've got, it's so easy for us when it's not our kind of primary role just to feel overwhelmed by the things that we're hearing back. So um, in order to help with this, I think 
Um, I find media sales professionals always really benefit from some basic knowledge of key metrics, you know, understanding things that they're going to come across on a daily basis, what an open rate is, for example, what a click-through rate is, um, just to help them understand some of the jargon that advertisers are talking, you know, what they're talking about. And I don't think it needs to be at the point at all where a sales team knows more about digital marketing than the client themselves. But I just think having that basic framework and perhaps you know during the onboarding phase of when a a new salesperson joins you or part of you know ongoing sales training I think having that basic understanding of of you know digital advertising in the areas that you need is is so useful these days um but I would say I don't I don't think we should shy away from talking honestly to advertisers you know if you're on a call and they say something, I don't think there's any harm in, in saying, actually, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean. Please, could you tell me a bit more? I'm, I'm so fascinated by this area and I'd love to kind of hear it from your perspective. You know, people love to talk about the things that they know about and being a little bit humble in those sales relationships, actually, I think can just deepen that relationship so much more. I couldn't agree more. I think there's really nothing to be gained by tap dancing or, or professing to know more than you do or trying to be to pretend. And I think being curious is a hallmark of a great media sales professional, you know, being inquisitive. Um, The thing that's interesting, though, I I think this is where we can go the other way. So I've seen a lot of media sales professionals who have a a pretty comprehensive digital knowledge, but often they can make the mistake of going out to market and using a lot of jargon and almost, you know, creating a situation where they overwhelm and baffle um, and and almost uh, uh, mobilize a client because they're throwing so much different kind of information at this client rather than being able to simplify and articulate a proposition. What are some tips for sort of packaging and positioning a multi-platform offering to clients in a way that's really simple for them to understand what the full proposition is? Like, you know, have you observed any anyone or any situation where they've really brought it to life in a way that kind of represents best practice? Yeah, I think you always bring it back to what the client is looking for. And you know, let's say an advertiser, for example, is working on a lead generation campaign. You know, in your proposal, I would suggest you explain why each element of the the package that you're offering ultimately helps them achieve that really specific objective. And I would try and make everything very clear with artwork deadlines, delivery dates, the schedule. And really important, I would try to establish beforehand with the client what success looks like for them because if you determine this afterwards you just run the risk of hearing you know that the campaign failed so I would try and understand exactly what their key kind of metrics or what their KPIs are looking like beforehand and by really understanding that you can work closely with the client to help deliver what they're looking for and in terms of kind of bringing it to life Jamie I mean I think multi-channel campaigns can be just so powerful and I think when the messaging and the creative is all aligned across multi-channel, but it's all been repurposed to suit the individual channel where it is, that can work so powerfully. You know, just reflecting on, um, on some of my experience, or at least where I've seen it really work, it's, it's just probably looking at my own media consumption habits and thinking about the way that I typically consume media across different platforms and, it's it's always been really interesting um, how detached from the end user media sales professionals can be at times. We can we can start putting all these elements on a plan and thinking about their specific role and can somewhat kind of lose sight of the fact that it's human beings and people that we're trying to engage. Um, and definitely, I think when you can get that that kind of media placement and that creative really working in harmony on a multi-platform solution. It is, it is very cool. It's very, very powerful. Um, and, and almost easy to kind of then sell to a client because you're really bringing it back to a human insight and a, and something that's actually quite commonsensical for them to be able to understand. Absolutely. And, you know, so many advertisers already know this, but the campaigns that work best, you know, they always have that kind of storytelling element to them and, you know, really, really inspiring content, really good creative and and just staying true to their brand. And I think that's where really good campaigns can stand out. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, you and I discussed this next question a little bit offline. And I guess being a sales director for so many years, maybe I was, I had my own bias at play here, which is that they're obviously, um, they're products that the market will typically want to buy from a media publisher. Um, and then there are often the products that the media publisher will really kind of encourage the sales team to take out to market. Um, and sometimes those two things don't necessarily align. Sometimes, 
you know, um, a new product, it's unproven, it hasn't been tested in the market, there's a bit of reluctance, um, and the market really want to buy, you know, the core product, or there's a, there's just a little bit of a different um, set of kind of priorities that the that the media publisher might be putting on the sales team. I'm curious if this dynamic sort of plays out with the companies you consult to and, and you know, any tips for people on that front line of how to, how to manage those kind of competing priorities? Yeah, that's a really difficult question. And I think it's, you know, understanding with the publisher and where their kind of priorities really, really lie. If it's a very commercially led operation, then I think having feedback and really listening to what advertisers and clients are looking for should shape the strategy in the long term and and if that's not the case then i think media sales the media sales team needs to be aware of where those boundaries are and um you know not be afraid to to explain them to advertisers when they are i think it, you know it all comes down to just having a really good internal processes and just being open with the team also like media value is where probably a bit of friction comes up which is sort of my next question i think we've often said value is sort of in the eye of the beholder and often a new proposition or a new platform that's being incorporated into a multi-platform cell, um, it can be unproven or untested, and it can cause a bit of friction, particularly at a pricing level. How have you seen new products be introduced into a cell, uh, you know, without devaluing them, or, um, or you know, I guess the old uh, trap of being thrown in as value add or bonus? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, I've seen it so many times, and I've worked myself on a print magazine that didn't exist when selling the space and you know I've worked on a recruitment site in the past few years that there was no it wasn't launched there was no historic kind of data to go back on and I've worked on events that kind of haven't happened before and it is it is a real challenge and I have to say I did never drop the price on any of these simply because they were untested and I think the important thing when selling a new proposition is to think of all the advantages and the opportunities that it would bring to the client and focus on those. And if there are objections relating to the fact that it's untested, I think they're best overcome by explaining the rationale behind the launch. You know, in the case of the recruitment site that I just mentioned, for example, I focused on the market need for such a platform. There was anecdotal feedback from readers and the sector that it was in saying you know there is a space here that's not being filled that would be genuinely useful to us and I also showed them the marketing plan for how organic traffic would be brought to the site and how, you know the kind of the work that was going into it that would help um, you know give it the visibility that we were saying that it would and I also talked about the experience of the team behind the product and I think that helped to explain you know, the reasons why we were offering what we were offering and the reasons why we were so sure that it would be the right thing for them. And I would say as well, Jamie, sometimes with new products, you know, if it's an additional platform or a new newsletter or a new print magazine, for example, and it's kind of an add on into something that's already, you know, a publishing suite that already exists, I would say, you know, talk to existing customers, existing advertisers about what you're planning, not necessarily as a direct sell or anything, but just just ask them and just say, you know, you're, we're, you know, you're a, a really key client of ours and we really value your feedback. Like, you know, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on this that, w- that we're planning? And you may find actually that they come back actually quite interested in it as well. So it can work, you know, not just from getting feedback from the market, but also actually as a sales approach as well. I think that's a great call. I think we, we often overlook the value of market testing or socializing new products in market. I know there's nothing more powerful than picking up the phone to an advertiser and saying something along the lines of, we're looking to build this new potential thing. Would you be interested in having some input into the design? Um, you know, this is what we th- we see it doing, but we want to know if this would be of value or interest to you if we were to do it. Um, it can be a really good way to get a bit of interest and appetite from the market and also prove out the hypothesis um, before you start putting a bit of effort and energy into creating something. Absolutely. Hey, this is Jamie. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast. If you are interested in learning more about this topic of multi-platform media, you should check out another podcast we did on a similar topic. It's titled Sell the Dish, Not the Ingredients with the masterful David Fish. Here's a snippet now. We, we take all this stuff, um, we collect it from around the business and to your point, we know the product really well and sometimes too well. <laughs> we sometimes know our trade internally uh, and all the bits that go into our trade too well and we let that escape out into the market and we let that go into our presentations and we confuse and we baffle and we bore. 
That was called Sell the Dish, Not the Ingredients. It's in the back catalogue. The wonderful David Fish was our guest. I'd recommend once you listen to this podcast, you go back and have a listen to that one too. Thanks. So in my experience, and it's probably the last question on this topic before we jump into the listener question, but I think nothing can kill a multi-platform sales opportunity like a bad implementation. Um, you know, that post-sales fulfillment is so critical, making sure all those elements um, are executed as prescribed and with more elements and with more detail and with more of, um, of these different uh, touch points, there comes more opportunity for a client to either misunderstand what they're getting um, or an issue to fall down. How do media sales professionals really sort of, you can never avoid it fully, but how do they maybe mitigate the risk of a campaign falling down in implementation or a client's expectations, you know, maybe not being met? Yeah, that that is so important. And I'm so glad you mentioned this because um, it can be so easily forgotten. And you know, something I teach a lot in sales training is that the sales process doesn't end when the sale is made, you know, far from it. And depending on the size of the organization and the structure, media sales professionals, you know, they often play actually quite a large role in the implementation of the campaign, you know, whether it's artwork collation or uploading assets online or something like that. So, you know, particularly on smaller publishers, they actually play quite a big role in that implementation phase. So, I think, as I mentioned before, it's always a really good idea to set out a clear project plan and share it with all associated people, you know, make sure it has deadlines, specs, um, and so on. And I think it's also just important to keep that conversation going with a client. You know, I think salespeople work really hard to get their business in. And but post-sale, that's when you really show your true colours. And if you want clients to come back and work with you again, they need to know that working with you is a pleasure, that you care about their business, that you're you're willing to, you know, work hard to make sure that it's successful. And that implementation phase is the time to show it and just being there for the client and actually monitoring how the campaign is going. You know, let's say you've uploaded some digital content. If it's not getting the impressions or results that you were expecting it to, work with the client before it becomes a problem and before they become disappointed. You know, perhaps the artwork's not quite right, perhaps the messaging's not quite right, and it's a good idea to see how these things are going as they go rather than get to the end and the client say, well, I'm really disappointed and I won't work with you again, And you know, when it could have been fixed so much earlier on. Such a great point around being able to monitor a campaign's performance in real time. I mean, I think many of us who came up selling media, traditional media, it was often difficult to get an understanding of whether it was performing or not until either after the campaign or based on only the client's feedback, whereas now we do have that opportunity to to monitor and optimize in real time. And I think that's such an opportunity to for client engagement and retention. If you think about, you know, maybe a nervous advertiser, maybe it be, it's their first time, being able to give them assurance and give them updates in that critical first stage of the launch of the campaign where you can report on, look, we've had a look at your your uh, your landing page or we've had a look at your open rate or we've had a look at the delivery or the engagement of this post and something's not quite working. So here's what we're going to do to correct that. I think there's something really powerful in being able to just keep that dialogue really, really close and really collaborative with the client in the early phase because the alternative oftentimes can be they hear nothing from the media salesperson and suddenly they start wondering what they're doing and then they get a bit of buyer's remorse. And, and that's a phone call that I don't think any media sales professional wants to have is the uh, the cancellation call or this isn't working call. So I think that's a great point you just raised there, Helen, around really kind of making sure that you can effectively start the sales process at that implementation phase. Absolutely. I think it's, it's you know, having the opportunity to work closely with a client is a is is a chance to just keep building that relationship and keep that conversations going. So definitely. I can't ask my sales manager that. So we've got a listener question. Um, this one was submitted via LinkedIn, which is where most of them are coming through now. And uh, this one I think is going to be right in your uh, wheelhouse here, Helen. Here we go. Hey, Jamie. I work for a digital publisher that's now moving into events. My VP of sales is getting us to go and sell sponsorship opportunities for this event that we've never done before. Do you have any advice for how to A, represent a sponsorship opportunity in the market, particularly how to sell the value of it, and B, overcome client objections when they say it's untested and we haven't done this before? Thanks, pal. I feel like that's something you've 
potentially had some first-hand experience doing yourself. Helen, what's the initial thoughts on uh, that question? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And if you're working for an established publisher already and they're kind of launching a new event or a new channel, I would see this as a, as a massive opportunity. It's a new way of reaching out with clients. It's something, it's a different conversation. You know, there are potentially clients out there that you've never worked with before that would be really interested in this event. So being really positive, being really passionate and trying, you know, just going back to that mindset, just trying not to get too kind of fixated on something that it hasn't been there before. Or there, ha- there isn't just all this data and all this history around it and just being being really, you know, excited and passionate about the project. I know it sounds crazy, but it just helps so much because if people hear that you're excited and you think it's great, then, you know, then they'll feel that too. And like, I mean, kind of, we, t- we touched about it a little bit before, but try to focus on the opportunities that you think it will bring the client, you know, focus on the why, why are you launching this? Why is it happening? Why is there this enormous opportunity? And, and try to really, really focus on that rather than, you know, the, the kind of practical elements, if you will. So sell the sizzle. (laughs) Is there a sort of go to market plan for, for those types of opportunities where, um, maybe like a certain category of advertiser is targeted like is it is it about creating some sort of like exclusivity or trying to generate some demand through some different means as well yeah sure i mean especially if it's um events and there are sponsorship opportunities i would imagine that there are only two or three different opportunities and once they're gone they're gone so yeah there's definitely that kind of exclusivity or kind of you know having that prominence that other brands therefore wouldn't be able to get and that's a really good way of of looking at it if um if it applies to the situation it's really interesting um this event sponsorship space it's not something i've dealt with too much but it does take a little bit of a different set of sales skills to sell i feel in that you're often not selling uh pre-built inventory or you're kind of selling content and you're kind of selling signage and brand association and you're kind of selling like lead generation. And it's a really interesting space um, where you almost are selling a multi-platform opportunity in and of itself in terms of all the different ways that they pre-promote the event, all the ways they kind of capture and share the content afterwards. It's an interesting space. It sounds to me like for this person, it's, it's, probably a challenge in the sense that they're just trying to figure out how to create almost like a a way to package and position all of these different things so it feels like a a, a bit of a kind of cohesive integrated campaign yeah definitely and i think during the calls you know during a, a sales call to somebody you're trying to sell the sponsorship opportunity to like you know, like exactly as you said if there's only kind of two or three opportunities and there's potentially exclusivity or just something that other people aren't going to get you know f- focusing on the why are you talking to them? Why are you asking them? You know, identify the reason behind why you think they would benefit from this opportunity and and make it personal in the call. Like, you know, say, well, I thought of you when we were looking at this great opportunity and having it kind of personalized to why that particular business would benefit from it, I think would help as well. I love that. I think that's a great idea. Well, I am going to, first of all, put a link to Inktop and your LinkedIn profile in the show notes for people to connect with you. But um, before that we wrap this up, I'd love to hear a bit more about Inktop. What are you guys doing at the moment? What are the what are the things you offer to people, you know, to our listeners in the UK? Do you do training sessions? Do you do coaching, consulting? Tell us a bit more about, about the business and, and what you guys are kind of focused on right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we have we manage outsource sales for a couple of clients at the moment, and we um, we also do a huge amount of training. Um, usually, we're going physically into offices and you know working with media sales teams now, which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I love teaching online as well, but it, you know, it's so lovely to be you know post pandemic to be able to go back out and into businesses and kind of really see what's happening and being able to work with people face to face again. So. Yeah, we spend a lot of time doing training for all kinds of different publishers and B2B markets, B2C markets and trade press. You know, anyone who's got media sales professionals kind of selling sponsorship or commercial opportunities, um, I feel would benefit from our training. And we do um, on the consultancy side, we you know, this is a really interesting time because so many of our clients are looking, you know, they've got quite a print led traditionally print-led publishing strategy and they've recently changed and now they're looking at how to take their advertising revenue through different channels and onto different platforms and you know that's where we come in and we can kind of help show 
you know, how to redirect that and how to build a new advertising model. So yeah, it's it's just lovely. And I th- I feel like our services kind of complement each other, to be honest, Jamie, because you know, we're learning from from everything we're doing and um, you know, we, we teach we teach what we do and you know, and then we do what we teach. So it just you know, the the different services that we offer I feel just kind of work really well together and really our knowledge kind of really benefits our clients. Yeah, I I really have to applaud you for what you guys are doing. I mean, a big a big part of my motivation to start this podcast was that there just really isn't a lot of content or or resources available for learning how to do media sales. You know, it's you're often taught by your employer how to sell their product, um, but it's very rare that you can you can access good information or data around some of the more soft skills that are required to do this profession. And um, I would say particularly, and, and the link is in the show notes, guys, uh, check out the blog um, that in top right, there's some great, uh, some great things they've covered off there that I found really insightful and really helpful. And um, I guess to round this out, Helen, I'd love to know, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, but for the listening audience, they're listening to this episode, it's very likely they've probably got a a multi-platform product offering that they're really trying to make sense of and trying to position and package in market. Um, is there maybe one piece of advice or one parting thought you might give to those people that they can take away and potentially apply, you know, immediately this week? Yeah, to everyone, don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, I've learned everything kind of ground up. I was thrown in the deep end at the beginning of my career and um, I just ask everybody around me all the time. It probably gets annoying actually, but um, just don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to reach out to people around you. Don't be afraid to kind of even contact, you know, your friends if you know someone who's a digital marketer, like, and you want to ask questions, like just, just kind of go for it and just deepen your knowledge all the time. It's a great thought to part on. Helen Coston, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We wish you the very best. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you for the opportunity. And it's been it's been so lovely talking to you. Mm-hmm.